Welcome everyone to the next edition of the Great Reads Book Club from Mediate.com. I'm very, very excited today to have Jake Ward with us, uh, hosted by our friend Amy Schmidt. So Amy, please kick us off. Hey, thanks, Colin. All right, so we are going to be talking about The Loop, um, which is a fantastic book about technology and how it's creating a world without the choice and how to fight back. Right, and for that, we have Jake Ward. Since 2018, he's been a correspondent for NBC News, reporting for the Today Show, Nightly News, MSNBC, NBC News Now. He had also been a fellow at Stanford at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, along with its partner, the Virgin, I always say that wrong, the Virgin Institute. Can you edit that out, Colin? Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which gave me space, which gave him space um, to work on this. Um, he also has been an editor of magazines. Um, most recently, he was editor-in-chief of Popular Science. He's been working in technology and reporting for quite some time. Um, and we're really excited to sort of dig into this book, The Loop, which is really fantastic. So first of all, Jake, thank you for taking time with us. We know you're super busy. I really appreciate you both having me. This is going to be very interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. So to start with, um, kind of, I guess, a typical question that you probably get, um, what was your journey in deciding to write this, especially as a journalist, right? And you sort of have these different stories and even the way the book is written, it appears, you know, different essays and kind of stringing them together. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear about your journey in putting this together as a book. Yeah, so for me, this was the combination of basically two worlds that I had been uh, straddling over the last decade, essentially. Um, on the one hand, I had been a technology journalist uh, working in popular science, then working at Al Jazeera, and now working at NBC. And over and over again, I was um, meeting companies and entrepreneurs who were deploying pattern recognition systems and other forms of technology to predict human behavior, try to get out in front of it. At the simplest level, it was typically trying to predict human behavior in order to sell people stuff. But it also um, is more and more becoming technology that is trying to get out in front of things like conflict and uh, getting out in front of hiring decisions, who's going to perform best in a job, who's going to repay a loan, who's going to jump bail. We are trying to use automated pattern recognition systems to make those kinds of decisions. Now, I knew about that at the top level, but it wasn't until I entered the second phase of my life that I really understood that there was a larger question to address. And that second phase was uh, a journey I took uh, beginning in 2013, 2014 on a PBS show that I got to do. It was a four hour series that took me all over the world called Hacking Your Mind. And Hacking Your Mind was essentially a crash course for me and for the viewer in behavioral science. And for you guys, this is very remedial stuff, but for the average person, including myself, um, you know, it is just not, it, it is big news to discover um, that the last 50 years of behavioral psychology, behavioral economics, and the rest of it has basically taught us that human decision-making essentially rests on an ancient instinctive circuitry that really came to bear, you know, uh, sort of grew out of our need to very quickly spot strangers and snakes and calories. And that the, and the other big finding and the big takeaway in the show is we have built this modern society of ours on that ancient instinctive decision-making system. Now, what researchers like uh, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, and the constellation of researchers that they inspired, um, uh, you know, one of their sort of big findings is that you can predict a lot of what people are going to do using that kind of ancient circuitry, even in the modern world. And for me, it was such a jarring experience to go all over the world, meet all these people and be the guinea pig basically of this show and see that again and again, my behavior and the behavior of millions of people falls into these predictable statistical patterns. Well, then I started thinking about all of these companies using, you know, I mean, from Facebook on down, using AI to try to predict what we do. And suddenly I realized I was looking at a very different world than the one we currently occupy. And I began to worry about a generation or two from now, how it is that we will be able to make decisions 
using our higher cognitive functions mm -hmm. when so much of our programming wants to make instinctive decisions, wants to outsource decision making to uh, uh, you know, our environment in the old days, but in this case to AI, and then the huge profit motive of, of companies trying to cut down on time and save money by deploying technology to do things that humans either find too tedious or in some cases even too morally uh, repugnant to get involved with. So, uh, you know, I just hadn't seen anybody putting those two worlds together. And my time at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at, at Stanford was this amazing opportunity to speak with all of these different amazing researchers and to see places where those researchers were trying to get together with the tech people and talk it through with them. And those conversations were not going very well, uh, certainly the ones that I witnessed. And so for me, it was, I wanted to put these two worlds together and try to get those two sides talking about one another, trying to get us thinking beyond just one financial quarter at a time. And, you know, uh, uh, just sort of put together a, a broader multi-generational look at where I worry things might go if we don't start getting out in front of these questions right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, part of what sparked my interest in the book, not only as a dispute resolution person, but also as a teacher, because you worry about creative problem solving and what's going to happen to the future when they're sort of run by AI without realizing it, um, how pattern recognition and, you know, at one point, sure, it might be convenient that um, you're on Facebook and it pops up something you wanted to purchase, right, because you had looked, you searched that same thing a year ago, um, but it's creepy too, and it takes away our sort of creative problem solving that we use. So I wondered also, you know, kind of going through the book and deciding which stories to talk about and and were there any that really struck you? You know, which would be your favorite? Because there's a lot of different characters, a lot of different stories that are included in this book. So I wondered if there were like your favorite or some of the things that really stuck with you. Well, I mean, I had so many very haunting uh, experiences over and over again. I got to spend time with law enforcement officials who were trying to deploy predictive systems for understanding where crime was statistically most likely to occur and looked at the behavioral effects that that might have on officers who were basically being primed to, to really turn on their antennae only when the software tells them to. Um, I had, uh, you know, a hugely powerful experience um, going through the history of redlining and the discrimination baked into the mortgage uh, system and, and how that is now being carried forward into these um, uh, AI systems that ostensibly are neutral, that we assume to be neutral because they are technology, but that turn out to be, in some cases, kicking out patterns that are more racist than even the most racist human decisions. Um, you know, one really powerful episode for me, though, I think has been thinking about addiction as a, a, a sort of a human frailty and, and, and the multiple ways in which it is a human frailty. And so one, one thing for me was a very powerful thing was I spent time with a cardiologist named Sean David, who had basically spent his life trying to fight the encroaching effect of cigarettes and the, you know, the, the deadly, uh, you know, one in two chance of uh, developing cancer when you smoke cigarettes. And he said this very interesting thing to me that really stuck with me, which was that cigarettes are essentially a evolution proof vice that we don't have a natural defense mechanism against them. And one of the main reasons is that you can pass on your genetic predisposition, if, if that is in fact why you wind up smoking. People smoke for all kinds of reasons, but that's one of them. But he makes the, makes the great point that you can pass on your genetic predisposition to your offspring before the cigarettes kill you. So not even evolution offers any sort of interruptive mechanism on that. And to me, that was a very powerful thing because I think people tend to group AI together with television and cars and the printing press as, you know, oh, it's a disruptive technology, but it's just a matter of degrees. And if we just control ourselves better, we'll do better. But what my time talking to addi real addiction experts taught me and helped me pour it over into this is the ways in which AI is, is also escaping any sort of natural defense mechanism we have. And if anything, 
plays into these tendencies we have that make us even more likely to begin to rely on them. We love to hand off our decisions to systems we don't understand. We love uh, to um, uh, basically look down on other people's frailties. Uh, America in particular is super intolerant of people's uh, addictive tendencies for some reason, even though addiction is like a mainstay of Western society and of Western capitalism, right? And so to me, all of that was very haunting and, and set me up to kind of see the ways in which we are not only in danger of kind of handing over our really important decisions to automated systems we don't understand, but we also are allergic to understanding ourselves in this sort of fundamental way. And the ugly, difficult, gritty stuff that you guys deal with all the time in conflict resolution, right? All of that, we just don't understand ourselves very well. And yet we're already trying to automate big, important decisions, even though we don't know why we make them even in the best of times. So for me, th that experience was really powerful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that is currently happening, as you know, is where you can use data analytics or AI, um, mainly data analytics right now, but you know, where you talked about risk assessments um, and judges looking at these assessments coming from quote unquote, the data, um, and then anchoring biases come into play. Um, I wonder if you thought at all about that aspect as well, not just sort of the um, addiction, if you will, but also this idea of anchoring bias where it's mm. coming from the data. Yeah. So. I, I spoke to a researcher at one point who studies the risk assessment packages, the, what I can't remember what they're called, bail, something, something, risk assessment packages, right? That, that um, are designed to help a judge more efficiently review the possibility that somebody is going to skip bail or maybe uh, commit another crime while they're out. And one of the researchers who was studying those packages essentially found that judges who used those systems tended to um, uh, toss away the suggestion if it didn't agree with their initial instinct or go with them if it did. So it ratified, in a sense, those judges' instincts. It's not quite the anchoring bias, like, like you said, but it's, but it's in that ballpark, right? It's, it's a, a, a hanging on to the first information or the first instinct you have and using a machine to, to just kind of make yourself feel better about it is one of the things that they were sort of worried about. Um, and there's a whole thing I think about how the legal system is built and that makes it, you know, that is that it calls into question all kinds of things about that. But that's sort of what, ha what happens over and over again is I had this, um, I can't claim he was a mentor or anything, but there was a guy, Kevin Kelly at Wired Magazine where I once worked who used to say, what is the, he used to ask us, what is the technology trying to tell us? What's it trying to tell us about ourselves, right? And so the fact that the judges in this case gr grab onto or throw away the verdict of the machine tells us something about the power given to judges to make those kinds of decisions, how capricious those decisions often can be. You know, there's all kinds of stuff you learn out of that. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, I, I, I found that those, you know, the, those uh, fundamental cognitive shortcuts that Connor and Fersky pointed out, things like anchoring and recency and availability and all that stuff, it just turns out to play so deeply into this world, not only in the ways that companies using AI can predict how we're going to behave, but also in the ways that we fall into either, you know, relying on these systems, over relying on these systems in some cases. Um, so yeah, that was a huge uh, uh, sort of, that was a thread I was trying to follow throughout the book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Colin, yeah, you want to jump in? Do I ever? I got a million things that I want uh, to I know. Here. But actually, one of the questions, I, I, I love that you, when you talk about the loop, and you actually talk in the book about three separate loops. And I was just wondering, for, for those of us, uh, for the folks in the book club who, who haven't had a chance to read the book, can you just describe sure. what those loops are? Yeah, so basically, I, I think of it as sort of three loops as in a dartboard. And the central loop is what the last 50 years of behavioral science has essentially taught us, which is this whole dual process theory of the mind, that we have an instinctive, fast thinking mind and a reflective, slow thinking mind. And we like to think 
that we're using our reflective slow thinking mind most of the time, when in fact, it turns out we're using our instincts almost always, even in stuff that we think we're engaging our higher functions, things like voting, it turns out. That loop, the innermost loop is that sort of loop of behavior and um, predictable choice making um, that the last 50 years of behavioral science has, has sort of taught us. Then the outer, the, the, the middle ring, the, the next layer out is the modern loop of um, analysis and marketing and political uh, uh, maneuvering that tries to take advantage of those instincts. The stuff like, you know, uh, uh, you know when, when you go crazy, on Facebook and rant on something that's much more likely to get engagement than anything else, right? That is the modern incarnation um, of the ways that we are marketed to and um, triggered by and, you know, and activated in all these sorts of ways by modern uh, industry trying to take advantage of that stuff. And then the outermost loop is what I worry is coming. And that is the not just analyzing the choices you happen to make, but analyzing to a much finer degree using artificial intelligence, the choices that you are likely to make uh, because, they, because we can make predictions based on what other people like you have, have made in the past. And not only make predictions about what, you, what song you might be interested in next or what video you might be willing to watch all the way through, but the ways in which we're also starting to use that same kind of off-the-shelf predictive algorithm to, as we've been discussing, decide who gets a job or which person to stop at the airport or whatever else it is, right? We want to hand off that stuff. And for me, the connection between those three loops is this central idea that we make our decisions using instinct most of the time. And only now I think has the loop sort of gone out to this place where it is really beginning to predict how we're gonna behave and in feeding suggestions back to us, it's gonna begin limiting our choices. And I worry that the loop some people like to think that, that AI, if we rely on it heavily enough, is going to free us up, give us back time and take away tedious tasks and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. I worry that if we let it go, especially if we let it go in the service of making money, mm -hmm. then we're going to wind up in a world where we're really at a, a, in a cycle of decreasing choices. And ultimately, I worry it's going to do to our ability to make important choices for ourselves and as a society what Google Maps has done to my ability to get around even here in Oakland where I live. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When it's already being used um, in ways that are not governed by the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but nonetheless are seen as benign business, mm -hmm. we can have real impact on consumers and real people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I have a lot of friends at Facebook um, from my time at eBay, but also people that I've met. And I, I don't know a single person with any ill will at Facebook. You sure. know, a lot of them, I actually was in the Peace Corps in Eritrea. One of my best friends who's a Peace Corps volunteer with me in Eritrea works at Facebook. And let me just tell you, just absolute wants to make the world a better place. But exactly as you say, Jake, I think what happened was Facebook essentially created algorithms and optimized them for profit. And I think that a lot of bad things can happen, as you say, exactly, when you take the power. And often I think this is, this is what happens in sort of the Wild West phase where we are now, where it's not regulated. And if you were to go to Washington, D.C. and have a discussion with a senator about AI, it, you know, they would barely know what the heck you're talking about. So we've not really technology is ahead of our ability to sort of make sense about, well, how do we how do we utilize these tools? How do we rein them in? How do we civilize them? But I think if you just say to the algorithms, OK, go optimize on profit, you can wreak an enormous amount of havoc oh, yeah. and harm. And that, that I share with you 100 percent, that fear yeah. of the outer loop is that this is just going to be you know, capitalism run amok. Um, but yeah. what, where, I, where I do break from you, and I think at the end, you come back around on this too. I do think technology is a tool. And I think technology, I think there was, a, um, there was an AI uh, scientist I knew at Google that, that said, um, uh, it's a little bit like a magic lamp, you know? And you can ask for a magic, you know, an incredible wish with magic lamp, but if you don't think through it, there could be mm. downstream ramifications to that wish that are completely unexpected. So then it's more like the monkey's paw. And I think that there's an element of we have to teach ourselves how to utilize these tools and civilize these tools. So it, it, just like any new technology that has the power for great good, I mean, social media and the internet has the power to 
you know, I, I think about my students in Eritrea who don't have access to information, who don't have access to opportunities in the world. Well, maybe maybe technology could give opportunities. You know, we know that 50 percent of people in the world don't have access to a justice system. Mm -hmm. So technology you might open those doors, but at the same time, it can also lead to the spread of misinformation and all the, the negative effects that we've seen on, on uh, dialogue. So I want to come back to you and say, you know, we often say that technology is a tool for the toolbox. The technology will do what you tell it to do. And mm -hmm. I think that you're right. That third loop can be scary when you think about how it could be abused. But also, do you think that there's the potential for the positive in the third loop to sure. maybe help us get insights and, and solve problems that were previously insoluble? Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, I think there, you know, we've, we have seen undeniably, you know, certainly in the, in the kind of binary up down decision making um, that, for instance, you know, AI uh, has served to revolutionize in medicine, right? Uh, you talk about, you know, you show a piece of AI enough um, pictures of moles that have become cancerous or not, and soon it's better. And this has been proven again and again, better at spotting which ones are likely to turn into cancer than a human practitioner with years of experience can by looking at the same photo. You know, so yes, absolutely. And there are and though and there are a handful of those cases in which you can both do that and make a profit doing that better that way. Mm -hmm. But I also think, you know, to your point of, you know, if it, it, it's a tool and we have to use it according to our values, I, I devote a section of the book to some of the most far out progressive cutting edge thinkers that I've bumped into in my sort of brief spins through places like the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences to show that those people would tell you that, you know, we really have no understanding yet of what our values are, that especially in the United States, we are such a young country, really winging it when it comes to how it is we think society should function um, that for us to pretend that we know how to pre-encode values into these systems is, uh, is according to the people that I spoke to, you know, they consider that a pretty naive idea. I had this experience, it's described in the book, where I went um, to a, a gathering of a bunch of AI creators and a bunch of political theorists and sociologists and psychologists on an academic side of the table. And at this meeting, the AI group was presenting a prototype that they had built for um, that would basically fill in the blank on certain propositions, ethical propositions. And they thought that if they had a, a human fill in, in in the blank enough times and then showed the patterns to a piece of AI, the guy said who was doing the presentation, he's like, we will arrive at a set of universal human values. And now I'll take your questions. And all of the academics raised their hand. Every single person in the room was like, right. and, and one of them said, the first one said, I have three questions. What is universal? What is human? And what are values? Right. And the whole meeting imploded, right? Nobody, everybody, it was a screaming match by the end of it. Not a screaming match, but it, but it was, a, it went badly. It was a pretty icy conversation from there on. <laughs> and so for me, you know, I, I think, and, and it's, and one of the reasons that I was so interested to speak to you guys is I think dispute resolution is one of the few places in which we really have created a choreography for at least putting some guardrails around the messiness of human into you know relationships mm -hmm. and have owned up to the reality that we don't always get along left to our own devices um you know in a way that i think we haven't in all kinds of other walks of life right i i, I think that we you know online dispute you know dispute resolution as a as a uh as a a uh, ability as a study is I think so much more sophisticated than something like our understanding, or at least the ways in which our understanding has translated into policy when it comes to something like addiction, right? We, we are so weirdly blinkered to the incredibly damaging effects of something like the legalizing of online sports gambling, which is now legal in 31 states and getting, and you know, will be voted on here in California in November. Um, it's as if we have not listened to uh, you know, and so, so the idea that we could pre-encode, right, pre-program a system to either help someone with addiction or not, right? We have no ability to do that, I think, right now. Dispute resolution? Maybe we could, but I think that it is, we are still such a young, new, I mean, you know, the, the behavioral science people who study real evolutionary uh, history when it comes to how the brain developed, you know, they, 
they say that our, our slow thinking brain, as opposed to our fast thinking brain, our slow thinking ability to reason through things and so forth is like 70,000 years old. The other one's probably like 30 million years old. Right. So this one as software is super glitchy, right? And the whole world we've built is totally experimental on top of that. And so, I don't know. So to your point, I think you're right. It is a tool, but we don't really know how to use tools well yet you know what i mean like so absolutely. For me, absolutely that's the way i that's the where i get that's where it gets so complicated and squishy for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well if we do sort of go into that a little further on the dispute resolution because yeah the people who are part of the book club are definitely interested in that aspect um why do you think in what ways do you think it could be positively used in dispute resolution well so i i chose as a, a, a an example of of the loop the, the sort of the future loop, um, this uh, company co-parenter, and I know that there is also our family wizard and there are other, you know, uh, players in that space um, that you guys know far more about than I do. But for me and for the audience that I was speaking to, co-parenter is really a revelation. The idea that, that the seemingly chaotic mess of, of a couple falling apart could in fact be so predictable that a natural language process uh, could analyze the texts of people in a dispute and say, hey, are you sure you want to say that? You know, it is shocking. I get gasps out of people when I tell that story. Um, and yet you guys know that in fact, you know, the, the, the primary, you know, the variables involved in why people fall apart in, in couples are so you know, homologous that, that they even have their own acronym, you know, like, I mean, it is incredible. So to me, that was a revelation, you know, um, and according to uh, uh, co-parenter and other companies in that space, it's wildly successful. When you throw a, a chatbot mediator in there, people who cannot get along suddenly, you know, really, at least on a sort of basic functional level are able to pick the kid up from karate and arrange those play dates and all of that stuff in a way that they could not otherwise. And so for me, it is inarguably positive that those people in that, sh in that time are come able to come together and that that child is able to enjoy a joint custody arrangement, which the, you know, I know the research is limited. It's hard to do, but the research that I've seen, the Scandinavian studies and the rest say vastly better for kids to have both parents in their lives. So fantastic, you know. The long-term thing, that third loop multi-generational thing that I'm trying to talk about, that worry is, okay, what if that kid grows up and is a parent, him or herself, do they know how to have hard conversations with difficult people in their lives without a robot mediator involved, right? And maybe, and you know, maybe we should all have mediators, you know, like in a way, maybe that's just how it should be. And I, and I don't claim to sort of know one way or the other, but I know that very, I don't think anybody's really thinking about what is going to be the long-term effect generations from now when people have relied on these systems as long as they have. Now, one thing I also just want to throw out there is I, I, I had a really powerful experience reading a book that then I wind up paraphrasing endlessly in, this, in, in my book um, called How Reason Almost Lost Its Mind. And it is a story, a history by a long list of academics um, of what were called the action rationalists. They were basically these mathematicians for the most part um, who came out of the Rand Corporation and out of the Department of Defense or the uh, whatever the Department of the Army or whatever it was called during World War II. And they were some of the architects of the original Berlin airlift, which was this triumph of logistics in which they fed Berlin from the air you know, uh, and, and pushed back uh, the Soviets' uh, efforts to, to starve out the citizens of Berlin, and the heroism of that then inspired this whole world of Cold War rationalism, which was trying to create, and don't let me, I feel like I'm talking to a room full of physicists about relativity, you probably know all about this, but, but for me, what was so transformative and amazing about this is the idea, the, the thesis of the book is essentially they fell in love with the idea that you could encode negotiation between nuclear superpowers and make a dead man trigger system essentially that would just take care of the conflict of the tension and what the authors wind up saying is no that's how you get to dr strangelove 
And instead, we have to let people talk it out. We have to make room for human, gritty, messy, tedious, morally challenging, you know, expensive interaction. And for me, it was such a powerful parable in all these other places I was looking at, at people desperately trying to shoehorn AI into a system to make it faster and cheaper and less morally onerous, right? So, so I think, yes, with, with online dispute resolution, it, uh, obviously the short-term benefits are enormous, but I also have met so many people in boardrooms who aren't thinking more than a quarter ahead, you mm -hmm. know, a financial quarter in the future. And, and so what do we, what do we, how do we preserve what's important and what you guys know is important about keeping people talking rather than just encoding it all? Well, I mean, the truth is when I read that and, and knowing co-parenter and knowing Jonathan Burke and knowing what it theoretically does, number one, how do we know that it's accurate? Um, how do we know it's not culturally inappropriate? How do we know that it's not sort of, is it always the female or male or, you know, who's sort of being shut down? I mean, I do worry about, cause there's a lot to be said for venting. Um, and there's a lot to be said for the psychology in dispute resolution to have that opportunity to sort of speak and get out your um, truth. Um, certainly we see that in restorative justice. So it's interesting when I read that and I was thinking ahead and yeah, we don't wanna stop people from learning how to have those conversations without mm -hmm. killing each other, right? <laughs> That's right. There was this, there's, there's this guy, John, uh, Lord John Alderdice. He's a member of the House of Lords, and he was one of the architects of the architects. He was he was involved in the Belfast Accords, the North Ireland Peace Agreement, and he's fascinating. He's part of this um, uh, big, basically, a, a research center that tries to study. Uh, extremism and conflict around the world mm -hmm. called Artists International. They're the most fascinating people and brave, so super brave. And he is a psychiatrist and also a member of the clergy and also a member of the House of Lords. And he was, a, he was so interesting. He said, he basically was, was kept pressing on me the point that we want in our society to move things along so much faster. But in his case with the Belfast Agreement, he, he said it took several years for everyone involved to even agree as to where they would sit at the table mm -hmm. to sit and talk. Where would George Schultz sit? Where would the, the, you know, the Protestant representative sit? Where would they sit? And he says, it sounds ridiculous. And people make fun of me when I talk about that. But the truth of the matter is, the longer we talk about that and argue about that, the le the, the, anytime they're arguing about that, they're not killing each other. And so it's great to sit and talk about something as silly as that. And then it took years more to actually hash out the real agreement, right? But all of that time, they're not killing each other. And, and I think that in the, by the logic of how companies whose whole mandate is to operate at scale and as quickly as possible, uh, you know, by their logic, that makes no sense at all. And this is why, you know, I had a federal judge, this guy, Tino Cuellar, say to me, we could make the process of entering a guilty or not guilty plea so much more efficient. We could make it a swipe left or right kind of deal. He's like, but that decision will change your life and you never get to take it back. And so he talked about this principle that he says is a thing in legal circles called weak perfection, where the system is built to slow you down, make you do the pain in the ass work. And for me, that's powerful. That's important. And we are, and there's no money to be made off that. And so that to me is a complicated thing. Well, I think this is something that will really resonate with the community who are listening to this conversation because we live in the messy parts of, you know, human implicit bias and fundamental attribution error and everything you're talking about. Um, you know, you talked about Schelling and, and Rafa and the game theorists, and, you know, you can't just do calculations and decision trees and then get rid of all the human complexity. Even if we had an AI that could listen to two minutes of an argument and then spit out a piece of paper that says, this is where you're going to end up, you still have to go through what we call the justice journey, the psychological journey. Mm. Um, Amy and I have a friend, Gene Sternlight, who runs the, who founded the Saltman Center for Dispute Resolution at UNLV. 
She and she wrote an article called "Pouring a Little Psychological Cold Water on ODR," and mm. I think what she says is people are just as complicated on either side of a video co conference exchange mm. or using an algorithm mm. as they are in person. And as you say, it's not about eliminating all of that inefficient salami slicing in a negotiation and then just getting to the number at the end. You have to go through the arc of coming to terms and listening to the mm. other side and feeling heard. And if we, you know, there's another researcher, Robert Condlin at the University of Maryland, that's talked about the little boxes approach, where you take a complex dispute, and you just go through a form and you click all the boxes and it spits out a result. That's, you're denying the complexity of human nature. And yeah. the, the father of ODR, a guy named Ethan Katch, he, he had a moment just like you described, where I was at a session where a guy, a technologist got up and said, we're going to solve disputes. And Ethan stood up and said, respectfully, sir, the power of technology to resolve disputes is dwarfed by the power of technology to generate new disputes. Mm, so mm. we're in the human complexity business. So mm. the framing of your book and your loops totally resonates with us because mm. we're social psychologists, we're counselors, you know, we, we know about that complexity. But I think the other side of it is, how do we civilize these tools? How do we use them? How do we minimize the risk? I know you quote um, Joy and, and Timnit in here, you know, mm. books like Weapons of Math Destruction and Automating Inequality. You know, these are design flaws. I do mm -hmm. think that if we figure out how to use these tools and civilize them, we can minimize the downsides. But I, I, I think you're right. There's a risk that the people who are just searching for profit we're yeah. going to use, get to these tools before we can, and we don't have the rules in place, and it's going to wreak untold havoc before we, you know, we, and it, it might, the horse may already be out of the barn by the time we start to have the conversation. And I really, I really hope that more people with practical experience of the gritty necessity of keeping a certain amount of human inefficiency and human psychology involved, mm -hmm. get to be at the table making the decisions about how these products are built. Because that is the other thing is that they are very often built by people who really have absolutely no practical experience of that only see an opportunity to disrupt what they consider to be an inefficient system. Mm -hmm. And I also over and over again have encountered people who believe that it is not their job to think about the ways in which their their products might affect our values or need to in some way compensate for past inequalities. I've spoken to people who, you know, make the algorithms that determine whether or not you get a loan and ask them, well, do you think you should be putting your, you know, thumb on the scale to help write past, you know, racist patterns and how loans are written? And they say, no, if I do that, that would be not only um, uh, logistically difficult, it would be unethical uh, for various, for, you know, libertarian reasons they have. And they basically say my fundamental responsibility is only to my shareholders. Mm -hmm. And if I do mm -hmm. anything other than that, I have departed from my fiduciary duty and, it, and that would be wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I also hear people say things like, um, you know, I'll, my stock question that I ask everybody when I've made a new technology is you've invented a new technology. It's fantastic. It seems to invite the need for a new set of ethics to go along with it. Have you also invented some new ethics? What do you think the ethics should be around the use of this? And more often than not, in fact, I would say I've almost never heard anyone say, oh, here they are. Instead, they say, it's not my job. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to do that. I, my job is to do this and then elected officials and maybe academics we'll sort this stuff out well yeah. not to be not to be defensive but we have created an organization the international council for online dispute resolution and we've articulated ethical principles and ethical nice. standards that we can measure against and self-certify and if we find organizations that are violating those ethical standards we mm. can shut them down so i think that that really that to me is the missing part of the technology revolution is exactly yeah. as you say this kind of libertarian orientation which is well i'm going to unleash this technology and whatever impact it has well that's not my job you know, right. I, you know, That's I created right. it. What could I do? It was going to be created no matter what. I think we have to think the other piece of it is as you describe. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a really interesting question to build yeah. those ethics and morals for these new tools. So, well, and also to be fair, the program on data governance here um, at Ohio State, we are also, I mean, you, you do have actually quite a few academics who are in on trying to create ethical norms around um, AI and the use of AI within businesses as well. So that's, I guess, some um, bright news, but, but I do think it's dangerous because yeah, I had done my own research um, back about the secret consumer scores and um, companies like Axiom and different um, lead generators and what was happening there. And um, yeah, you know, it's benign business. Um, so it's really hard to sort of shut that down or stop it. Um, and even when we do talk about um, ethical guardrails, you know, if they're voluntary, what do you do with the bad kids? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And, you know, I, I also can't tell you just how many, 
academics I meet who are hired away from academia into a campus in a play, you know, at a, at a big, you know, company, and they suddenly are surrounded by all the heroes of their, you know, academic constellation, and they're paid more than they've ever been paid, and they are treated as a scientist and describe themselves as a researcher, and then I try to talk to them about what they're doing, and they say, oh, no, I can't tell you a thing about what I'm doing, right, and that's the end of that, right, so, so there is a way that, uh, so I, I really applaud the work that you guys have done in your sphere for creating these sorts of uh, uh, guidance, you know, for this kind of guidance, because there's, I think, very, it's, it, there's very few places in which that's the case. And I, I really think it's going to have to come down in most cases to the courts. I think it's going to become necessary for a, a handful of big lawsuits to change things. We started this conversation talking about cigarettes. The reason that the three of us are not sitting here smoking right now is because lawsuits, uh, you know, and liability law made it possible to sue and bring, you know, and, and get such enormous damages out of the companies that were purveying, purveying this stuff that it, it was no longer, you know, they, they fell out of favor in society, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we developed some norms around not smoking in public, not smoking on planes, not smoking in bars. And so, you know, that's, those wheels move a lot slower than the technologists who build this stuff, but they move. And just as it took several years to get everybody seated properly for the Belfast Accords, and, you know, just as it took 30 years to get gambling addiction into the DSM-5, mm -hmm. you know, I think we have the mechanisms to build some guardrails around this stuff. We just haven't, we haven't done it yet. We're at the very beginning of beginning to, to wrap our, mm -hmm. our minds around it, I think. Well, and also I hope that we start to see more positive incentive structures toward yeah. um, doing the right thing toward positive AI. I mean, I have students who are really interested in using AI for positive um, uses. And I, so I really, that resonated at the end of the book, sort of, you know, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. We get to the end of the book. Thank goodness there's a little bit of light. So thank you for that. Well, I'd also say, if you look at what happened with privacy, you know, the horse was out of the barn before anybody got there. You know, in, in DC, as I said, they started to say, well, how can we protect privacy? It's like, it, it's already gone. There's no privacy. You've lost. <laughs> but the thing about AI is I think there's so much hype. I still think that a lot of these applications people talk about are still still a ways away. And that gives us an opportunity. The thing with cigarettes is the harms were done and then you had to use the lawsuits to rein in the mm. bad actors. And hopefully mm. if we can get ahead of this, we can prevent some of the real damaging stuff from occurring. And then, then it's not a matter of trying to rein in the bad actors. We can prevent this stuff up front because we see it coming. And I agree with Amy. You know, this is a hot, hot topic. I see conferences all the time at Stanford and in the ODR field around the world about ethical mm -hmm. AI and how can we how can we constrain and audit the use of AI to make sure that it's not working. You know, in ways that oppose our our civic interests. So. Mm -hmm. You know, from your mouth to God's ears, Jake. So thank you. Thank you for this book. This is a huge, huge contribution. And this is fascinating to talk to you. I could go on another another hour or two, but I think we want to have a little bit of time to uh, get some questions in. So Amy, do you have any last comments you want to, want to no, make? No, just thank you. Up? Great. No, great book. And I know um, my students will definitely have questions. Maybe they can send them to you or, or pass them along. But either way, um, thank you for taking all this time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, you guys. I learned as much as I uh, hopefully uh, gave you. So thank you, really. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, Amy, thank you for an excellent interview. Um, and there were some great discussions in the chat as well. I don't see Jake yet, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that he'll join us in a minute. But um, so does anybody have any thoughts or comments or reactions to the points raised? Yeah, Bob, please. Oh, you're on mute. I apologize. Um, you know, this was uh, quite special and quite important um, because I do think that it, it, for, for lots of reasons that were mentioned and a lot that were not mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the framing of it and uh, I'm anxious to have an opportunity. I don't know if we should actually wait because I'd like to address it to, to uh, to, to Mr. Ward, Joshua. Um, but what we're really talking about here, and, and I'm concerned because as I read Kahneman uh, and I'm still seeing the prejudice um, in terms of how we frame the issue um, as being 
a superlative in being rational and reasonable as opposed to the secondary um, uh, to be controlled, uh, intuitive, instinctive. Uh, what Kahneman calls fast and slow thinking is the uh, reasoned analytical from the side, that side of the brain uh, to the instinctive, intuitive, and suggesting that one is ancient and we can't get rid of it and we should try and the suggestion implicitly that I keep hearing being drawn uh, is that uh, we have to control the instinctive intuitive when in fact what we're going to be talking about it seems to me and that where I suspect he's going with his book uh, is an integration of the two. There is no such thing as any decision in science, in physics, or in poetry that doesn't involve both the analytical frame of thinking in the mind from that part of the brain and the intuitive instinctive. Mm -hmm. We're always constantly talking about that. It is indeed true that we in the negotiative field, excuse me, I don't want to even use the word true, it's a leftover anachronistic word from a rationalist system, as if you can say for certain what is true and what isn't. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, I'm seeing a shift in thinking of how we think about issues that our field has given us that I'm not sure we have quite gotten to know. And that is a negotiative frame of mind that goes beyond just doing mediation or negotiation or the specific format and goes to a kind of thing, thinking that is going to be essential post pandemic, post climate change, or in the middle of to deal with complex issues where there are no right answers. Wonderful. And, and, uh, and, and Bob, I see Jake has joined us uh, via mobile. Jake, thank you so much for, uh, I know you're in the middle of an assignment. We just finished watching the video moments ago. We really appreciate oh, good. it. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so sorry to make everyone watch a recording, uh, but I'm eager to talk to you now. So great. Hope you thank you. Me. Thank you. We've only got, we've only got 11 more minutes. So uh, you're not going to get hit with any too crazy questions, but Right, but Bob, can I be allowed? <clears throat> please, please, why don't you summarize the point you just made? In 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Josh, I was very taken by what you were saying. The direction of your thought, uh, you may know of uh, John Elster, who is a philosopher who wrote a significant amount on the being irrational is sometimes very rational, and sometimes being too rational is irrational. And that the concept here of how do we balance, I was concerned only about your framing that it seems to be still anchored in a rational thinking frame, which obviously came out of the enlightenment that suggests that we can determine the right answer to things. That is the purpose of what most people think is technology versus what we do in negotiation that appeals to you which is how do you assess and deal with risk and not only the known knowns, unknowns, but the unknown unknowns and the unintended consequences of things that we're doing, which is forevermore what human beings will be needing to do, AI pointing that up uh, most especially. I guess my concern for you is, is that as you suggest in here, that this is an older kind of thinking. If I were to, if Kahneman in fact says, we will never cure the instinctive, fast thinking, very often invalid thinking, because it's part of every decision. No one escapes it, not physicists or anyone else. And I'll leave it with just one last thing. The, fan, the Feynman quote is one of my favorites as he talks about science. He says, the biggest thing about science when you're studying it is to not be fooled. And the second principle of that is you're the easiest person to fool is yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that 
in our whole field of negotiation, I'm leery of giving too much credit to us in our field of negotiation. My fear is, is that uh, we are practicing our own form of hubris uh, when we think we uh, know how people should settle disputes or even what goes on in a predictable pattern and how you deal with people uh, as you help them work through their conflict. I'm done. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. But it really struck me in this is your work is invaluable because I think what you're what you're charting, beginning to chart, is a new way of thinking, mm. a different way of thinking, a paradigm shift that's come about by our age. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I I um, you know I I think uh the the process of writing this book was incredibly uh uh intimidating because i kept bumping into field after field in which people were sort of saying to me we don't really know how humans are supposed to be we're just kind of winging it out here in the modern world all the time and yet at the same time there's this extraordinary financial and logistical pressure on companies to try to disrupt how humans do things and make it more efficient and make it profitable along the way and and so it was it's it's i if i understand your point correctly i i really take it which i i i interpret as you know we don't really know how we're supposed to be in this world and and uh, assuming that we do and assuming that we can somehow pre and code a set of values or a choreography of human relations or any of that stuff into something like AI is, as you say, hubris. Unfortunately, I think there's just enormous financial pressure to be really efficient. I think about, you know, I've spoken to people in the past about the opioid crisis that we are in. And one of the, the root causes they talk about is that, you know, the, the research has all shown that pain management for the 50% of people who go into, let's say the Veterans Administration hospitals, you know, when 50% of VA patients are in there for chronic pain. And the research has shown that the chronic pain could be vastly better managed by physical therapy. If physical therapists were involved, it could manage the pain better. Problem is physical therapy is really expensive. And there are not currently enough trained physical therapists to possibly address all of the people who, in theory, need their help. And that is part of why we have turned to pharmaceuticals to manage chronic pain. And that, along with a bunch of other uh, factors, is part of what's driven us into this incredible opioid, heroin, fentanyl situation that we are in right now. So for me, there's, these, there's this push for efficiency and a push for cost savings that I just worry is going to get us into trouble around some really fundamental things like how we get along, how we make difficult moral decisions about each other, um, you know, that, that I just worry we're not taking enough time to think about ahead of time. Yeah, uh, Sharon, please, what's your question? Yeah, hi all. Um, and I confess I haven't read the book, but I'm getting it, Jacob. So thank you for I your work. That. You made uh, a sale, Jake. So good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was worth it. I work for the Colorado court system. I'm the director of the Office of Dispute Resolution. And I've been doing work in online dispute resolution. And we're getting ready to stand up some tools for our potential court customers and current court customers. And I've worked with co-parenter app. And so I'm, I'm steeped in this. And one of the things I think holds great promise for um, courts is to use AI for judicial decision-making examination because judges will say, I have no biases. I'm very, you know, I am really a neutral decision maker, but somehow our court systems have been responsible for over-representation of minorities in incarceration and other horrible biases. And so I think there's like a positive use of AI that I really hope to work in, in the future and looking at it. And then the huge issue that I've observed at being an attorney and an administrator in the court system is that the information disparity. And so it's not technically AI, but we can offer these tools to generate potential options. And then we want to slow it down. We don't want to swipe left to 
you know, enter guilty pleas or to agree to plead time. And yet, so I think we can go slow and then slow down. And that's the system I'm trying to um, think about designing. And so any thoughts that you might have on, on those two observations? Um, well, what you say, I, so I really, uh, Godspeed and God bless you for what you're doing. I really, uh, it's a noble uh, mission, what you're describing. It, it reminds me of, I've spoke to an organizational psychologist once about uh, using AI to make hiring decisions. And I was asking her, do you think that this is, you know, introduces the possibility of all sorts of hidden bias that, that, you know, society generates. And, and she said, you know, I, I think that yes, absolutely. There is that danger. On the other hand, I also think that if we could replace the racist instincts of a certain generation of hiring executive, uh, with, a, 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 an automated system that might be an improvement. And so finding that balance is the important thing. In what you're describing, it seems to me that we, you know, we, I mean, we're, we're it, it's a, it, I find the law to be such a complicated, you know, the courts to be such a complicated thing to think about uh, making quote unquote unbiased when, you know, the defense and the prosecution don't even draw on the same body of learning. There isn't even a, it's not like there's one bucket of evidence out of which they are both pulling what they've got. You know, you've got, you've got two sides assembling their own version of reality, right? It's so, and so for me, it's so complicated to talk about a lack of bias in that world when the whole, when it's an adversarial system. So that is so complicated. But I think that the, 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 the thing that I would be concerned about and would want to just make sure somebody uh, smart who thinks about explainable systems of AI um, looks at is the degree to which, right? Like all AI systems basically are just using past outcomes to make predictions about the future. And if those past outcomes have always reflected a racial disparity as they have, um, then you're just gonna be carrying those things forward. We found this to be true in mortgage uh, underwriting. We found it to be true in all sorts of other uh, walks of life. There's a section of the book that you might find interesting in which there was, in fact, a, um, a competition run by the FICO people, FICO credit scores, um, that were looking for an explainable, a transparent piece of AI that would arrive at a determination as to whether somebody deserved a loan or didn't, but could also explain itself to solve the black box problem of not knowing how these things make their decisions. And there was a team, a research team in there who um, basically short-circuited the whole competition and said, you don't even need to build a black box. Instead, here is a very transparent system that, that you can uh, create that will, that will explain itself along the way and doesn't even need to hide its work in the way that your traditional AI systems do. So I guess my, my big push would be, if you are doing this, maybe reach out to these researchers, you'll see them in the book, or somebody else out there who can help you make a system that really shows its work, rather than an off the shelf system, which I will warn you right now will be a cheaper option, um, such so, so that you're not in the position of, of knowing uh, only what it tells you it recommends and not knowing why it's making those recommendations, what data it's drawing on that, I think is the big trap in these cases. But again, Godspeed, what a so, great project. So Jake, I, re I really want to respect your time. If we could do <coughs> one last question. Uh, and so uh, uh, Ian, please. Um, I know you were awesome. talking about exactly this in the chat. Uh, yeah, so um, my question is still about your the legal decision-making. So you talked about introducing inefficiency um, so that we can like better like dampen the biases of the system one brain. So is the primary concern there that like the risk that the decision could be wrong, like in, or biased, or is it the concern there that people deserve that concern? Like basically put another way, like if we had a justice system where we knew that it, we could make an instant decision and we knew that it was perfect every time, um, like would that, would the problem still be there? Like is the concern about respect or is it just about harm? Um, so uh, my, my instinct in hearing you say that is that, right, there is no such thing as a perfect judicial system. And we have to make room to keep 
talking it through and hashing it out. Just as in science, right? There's no such thing as 100% certainty. And that's why you have peer review and people constantly trying to replicate each other's findings. And the, and the more you do it, the closer you get to confidence, if not certainty, right? So so to me, you, you have to... Uh, you, you have to leave open the door of talking things through. I think about like, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who was talking about how hard, how difficult it is to hire somebody for into, in our case, the news business who doesn't, whose resume doesn't at the top say, you know, news or cable news, or, you know, here's where I worked in the past. It, that, that it is not even really built, it's not even really part of the system now in hiring to be able to go outside of the normal keyword search because the AI tools basically run the show when it comes to, to putting a certain number of resumes at the top of the pile. And so it's very, very difficult to short circuit that and walk around it and then go to the HR people and say, in fact, I would like somebody who has no news experience, but is a very smart and open-minded person. You know, for me, the, the difficulty is if if we get too reliant on those sorts of systems, we're going to be in a place where no, where you can't even appeal them, where you can't even push back. Um, you know, we're seeing this with things like em, uh, employment fraud claims, where there's no way to even challenge uh, the claim because the auto, the system is so automated. So, to me, it's just trying to leave open some room for the messy, inefficient world of of talking it through, negotiating it through, making appeals, um, as opposed to kind of locking it into an automated thing. I don't know if I'm really answering your question here, but, but no, that, that was the, great. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I also want to say, I know that, that it's, it, 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 you, you said this at the beginning, you know, that like doing away with system one, it's not so much about doing away with system one, the Kahneman uh, universe would all say, system one has kept us alive all this time. System one is how you're able to drive a car from place to place and not arrive exhausted. I mean, system one is actually extraordinarily valuable. It's just that we fool ourselves into thinking we're using system two and we're actually using system one. And for me, it's that, it's that AI is going to sort of act as a system one. It's going to be, it's going to stand in for our instincts in a way that we won't be able to resist. And, and so, and, and, and the other problem is that in a capitalist society, nobody wants to sell stuff to system two. They don't want to sell stuff to your slow thinking brain. They want to sell stuff to your fast thinking brain. And so the more we appeal to, like, we need to keep it, it keeps us alive. But we, but, but if we make it the basis of all these products and we use them the way we use our instinctive systems, then I think we're going to find ourselves in trouble. Well, uh, let's leave it there. Jake, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for an incredibly thought provoking presentation. And thank you for your excellent book. So I know you sold some copies today. Keep up the good work. We'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out for you on NBC News moving forward. But we really appreciate you sharing yeah, your time you. with us. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks, Colin. See you. Everybody. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good weekend.